From its earliest beginnings, golf and the elements have been intertwined. It is a game at one with nature, where the contours of the land and the strength of the wind are factors in determining its difficulty. For generations, the coastline east of Scotland's capital city, Edinburgh, has been a prized location for the grand old pursuit. Many fine courses can be found in a region synonymous with the game, but the universally accepted jewel in the crown is Muirfield, home of the historic Honourable Company of Edinburgh Golfers, and for the third week in July of 2002, home of the 131st Open Championship. Muirfield isn't a newcomer to the Open Rota. The Lynx have hosted the championship on 14 previous occasions, starting in 1892, and the list of champions produced underlines its quality and fairness as an all-round shot-making test. Tom Watson won the third of his five Open titles here in 1980, and the Americans returned to rekindle those fond memories. Much the same as Nick Faldo, who triumphed at Muirfield in 1987 and again in 1992. Once more in partnership these days with Fanny Sunison, his caddy back then, Faldo's delighted to relive those moments of glory. Yeah, that's the worrying bit, 10 years have gone by. Still one of my favorite spots, so I'm uh, enjoying the memories from a few years ago. Momentous times indeed, and the 1992 championship was also the first open as a professional for Ernie Els. He finished fifth, one of six top 10 results in an event he relishes. I haven't won it, but uh, I've just enjoyed playing the Open Championship and um, you know, I've had a pretty good time here the last 10 years. The sweet swinging South African has two US Open victories on his CV, but his form immediately prior to the championship was a cause for concern. I've got to play a lot better. You know, I haven't played all that good the last uh, couple of weeks. It's a four-day event, so you just got to try and hang tough, but uh, I'd like to see my game a little bit better by Thursday. The man they all have to beat is Eldrick Woods, better known as Tiger. The world's number one is looking for the third leg of the Grand Slam after prevailing at both the Masters and US Open. First of all, I, I got to play well and take care of business this week and try and win the championship, and, and that'll be an end result. Woods appreciates there's much more to Muirfield than raw length, and he likes what he sees. It's a different style than the courses we've played, but it's one of the, the most fair golf courses we've played. It presents itself right in front of you. I mean, there's no hidden agendas, you know, no, no tricks or anything like that. It's just one of those golf courses that just, you know, it's very fair and come get me. In conjunction with the Royal and Ancient, the Honorable Company of Edinburgh Golfers have been responsible for setting up a course that has clearly received Tiger's seal of approval. One obvious defense of the Lynx is the rough. The rough traditionally here is, is penal and quite high. It has been higher, but I think has been seen in this championship that if a player does get in the rough, he really is struggling to get out, and he has to pay that penalty. The other natural defense mechanism for Muirfield is the wind, a regular visitor. Further complicating the issue is that the course is by no means a traditional nine-out, nine-back configuration. There are only a, probably two consecutive holes where the wind will be in the same direction. So in every tee, the golfer has got to think wind before he plays it. And I'm just very hopeful that before the championship is over, we will see the strong East Lothian wind, which will put him to the test. For the first day's play, it looks to be the best day of the championship. Calm at first, but the wind's picking up uh, from the east as the sea breeze sets in in the afternoon. With wind speed, temperature and the likelihood of rain very much on the minds of the competitors, there's a member of the Weatherman Brotherhood on hand to predict playing conditions. I'm a forecaster for the Met Office and uh, the Met Office is contracted by the Army to provide them with on-site site-specific forecasting, which um, gives you much more detail than perhaps um, they could get from other, uh, other sources. Muirfield isn't the Arizona desert or southern Spain. Weather patterns are, to say the very least, unpredictable. 
it can be very changeable just about any time of year, even during the summer, which we're in at the moment. And despite the fact that we've had high pressure over the last couple of days, it's not been easy to forecast. So what can players, officials and spectators expect for the week? Thursday and Friday, probably not a great deal of wind, but then the, the main uh, wind will come during Saturday and Sunday as we begin to get strong north easterlies uh, developing, so it is going to make for some tricky conditions. But come rain or shine, nothing would deter the legions of fans who rose early to witness Tiger's first shot of the week. Woods appreciates the British galleries. Fans over here that come out to the Open Championship are the most knowledgeable fans. My relationship's been absolutely great. I mean, they've been extremely nice to me and, and gracious, and that's what all of us who come out here and, and play in the Open Championship truly admire and respect about the fans, that they understand the game. Unfortunately, when Woods teed off at 9.01, a photographer was not so obliging. Want to take him after I hit the shot, please? <coughs> With concentration restored, Tiger's challenge commenced, although not with the desired outcome. Finding the rough from the first tee was a surprise to all and tested Tiger's powers of recovery much earlier than he would have wished. And yet Wood somehow managed to miraculously save par. He would go on to shoot a round of 70. Surprisingly, Woods was upstaged by both of his playing partners. The popular Japanese star Shigeki Maruyama chipped and smiled his way to a 68. And that score was matched by Justin Rose, whose game plan to focus on himself rather than Tiger worked well. Rose, fourth in the Open at Royal Birkdale in 1998 as an amateur, once again played superbly on home soil. I didn't get caught up in uh, watching him or getting involved or worrying about all the stuff that goes on around him. I still felt very focused on my own game and uh, realised that you know, the Open Championship's an important tournament for me. Rose wasn't the only youngster with high expectations. The signs were encouraging for Spain's Sergio Garcia, who penned his name to the list of amateur champions when he triumphed here at Muirfield as an 18-year-old in 1998. As amateur champion, Garcia was following in the footsteps of his fellow countryman, Jose Maria Oladabal. And the Spanish hat trick was completed this year when Alejandro Larazabal captured the title at Royal Porth Call in South Wales. Larazabal's father, Gustavo, and brother Pablo were there to see him secure a coveted exemption to the Open. And in Scotland, the family caught some of the morning action on television before heading out for a lunch tea time. The big day had finally arrived. The T's were crossed, the I's dotted, and Larathabal couldn't wait to get going. I've been looking forward to it for a month right now, and uh, the dream is always to play in a major championship, so I'm excited. It was, though, to be something of a baptism of fire. The putter didn't always behave. In the odd wayward drive, such as here on the 17th, didn't put Larathabal on the path to success. He recorded a six over par 77. There was better news for Garcia. On a day when few exploited the benign, almost windless conditions, he put together a round of 71 to get his challenge off to a satisfactory start. But the focus of attention wasn't monopolized by the younger brigade. 49-year-old Irishman Des Smith who created a new record as the oldest champion in European Tour history when he won the Madeira Island Open last season, enhanced his reputation as a link specialist with a 68. <laughs> Meanwhile, Els, still some way short of the veteran stage, quietly put together a 70 and a platform. 
Nothing very colourful about that round, but the same couldn't be said for the opening effort of Duffy Waldo. The anything but understated American brought a touch of Hawaii to the East Lothian shoreline. He reveled in the sunshine during a pace-setting 67. There's a lot of rough out there. Those bunkers are kind of deep too. Fortunately, we haven't had to play Lynx golf yet. <laughs> There's more American golf out there today. And that fact was reflected on a leaderboard in which the reigning US PGA champion David Toms and Phil Mickelson, arguably the best player still waiting to earn the status of a major winner, both figured prominently. The forecast for Friday, the second day's play, completely different from yesterday. Cloudy and wet this morning, rain easing a bit this afternoon, and the wind's moderate from the west. Day two began dull and rather miserable. Not ideal spectating weather, but with extra moisture on the greens and the wind continuing to hold off, the difficulty of the course eased. One of those to seize full advantage was Scotland's own Colin Montgomery. The seven times European money list number one followed a mediocre 74 with a course record of 64 that left the locals in cheery mood. After Monty's charge, no amount of rain could dampen their spirits. 64 around here is a, is a good score without dropping a shot. It proves that uh, I can play the game and I'm just uh, looking forward now to the weekend, especially the way that I'm swinging the club now. There was also a record-breaking achievement by another perennial darling of the crowd, Nick Faldo. The Englishman 69, a day after celebrating his 45th birthday, was his 34th sub-70 round at the Open, one more than Jack Nicklaus, the man who inspired him to take up the game in the first place. There wouldn't be another, though, as Faldo finished modestly in a tie for 59th. Just before two o'clock, Tiger Woods marched onto the first tee, and this particular Tiger was surrounded by scores of photographers. The player known for his focus was, as usual, the focus of their attention. He is, after all, the most photographed player in golf. Well, of course, the RNA and the Open Championship do know the value of the written press and the particular photographers because photographs do say a lot in terms of the instant appeal of a newspaper or magazine. So we do value their support of the championship. With over 600 journalists and photographers from more than 30 countries, it's a cosmopolitan competitive affair. Sometimes we see pictures and think that would look fantastic on, on TV, but it doesn't actually work on a still. And equally, I think you can get a, a fantastic image of, let's say, Tiger in the rough, the great clump of grass on the end of his club, and, it, and it's just frozen in time, and it's a, you know, it's a fantastic image. However, collecting the images is only part of the process. The process these days is very simple. You, you have a, a small digital card, which you can get 150 images on. So once we have some good stuff on there, we have a runner who will just take that card take it back to the office and there's a whole procedure set up there. There you go. The image is uploaded into the computer um, and we view the uh, images on the screen, um, edit the pictures we want and they're um, sent to the picture desk in London. Um, then they're broadcast to all the national papers and magazines that have contracts. So within two and a half minutes, three minutes of receiving the image, the newspapers have it on their desk. Justin Rose certainly wasn't in the frame after putting woes and a 75. But it didn't rain on the parade of Maruyama, whose sunny disposition lifted the murk during a second consecutive round of 68. Six under par for the 32-year-old from Shiba, who won his first US tour event this year. Watched by his mother and girlfriend, Woods began to make ominous progress in the right direction. Ominous, that is, for the rest of the field. 
his 68th left him in a tie for ninth alongside his buddy Marco Mira and very much in the thick of things. All departments of his game were in good working order. A big weekend was confidently predicted. Among the notables who failed to survive the cut was Tom Watson, winner of the Open on five occasions between 1975 and 1983. This time, he struggled from the word go. Young Laradabal also bowed out after 36 holes, but the experience more than lived up to expectations. The crowds are amazing, and this 18th hole with like this kind of stadium or is is pretty unique. Laradabal, a beneficiary of the Royal and Ancients policy of encouraging amateurs. I enjoyed it a lot. I'm a little bit uh, sad about my score because I played. Uh, way better than what it shows, but it was a really good experience. I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, good. It was a good experience. I played awesome. Podrig Harrington, at home on the links, did much more than secure the right to play all four rounds. The ultra-consistent Dubliner, who is becoming an impressive challenger in major championships, forged his way into joint first place alongside Mariama and the American Bob Tway with a controlled 67. Going one better was Ernie Els. While the round of the day undoubtedly belonged to Monty, there was no confusing the nine holes of the day. Big Ernie covered the outward half at Muirfield in a mesmeric 29 strokes. Els could do no wrong. When he walked off the ninth, he had put up some amazing statistics, headed by seven birdies and 10 putts. His momentum was broken by drop shots at the 11th and 13th, but he still carded a 66 to vault into serious contention. The first time was obviously quite amazing, really. I mean, you know, I just felt really good about my swing uh, on the range and um, just didn't quite play the same level on the back nine. Ernie's fellow competitors were no doubt mighty relieved by that. At the end of the day, Els was involved in a five-way logjam for the lead at six under par. That was to prove a sign of things to come. I've got an opportunity to achieve one of my goals, and that's win a Claric Jug. But it depends on the weather conditions. Um, obviously, we had good conditions today. But over the weekend, things might get a little bit tighter, and uh, you know, you still have to play the golf course. And, each hole the way it should be played. For Saturday, the third day's play, early starters will get the best of the conditions with the winds picking up for the afternoon, quite strong northeasterlies, about 30 miles an hour, bringing in a fair amount of rain, so with that wind, it'll be driving rain. Our weatherman proved to be on the button but still they came in their thousands to witness a day when the Scottish elements were to humble many of the game's leading lights. The stars of the show arrived, unaware of the ferocity of the tempest that awaited them, but by the end of the day, they were more than glad to find refuge in their various accommodations, especially those fortunate enough to be billeted behind the 10th tee at the Grey Walls Hotel, which has played host to the three most recent Open champions crowned at Muirfield, and many other famous faces. Around town, indeed right through to North Berwick and Edinburgh, spying a vacancy sign was almost an impossibility. But a place to rest wasn't a concern for the Swedes, who chose to lodge en masse in a nearby rented home. In general, the idea is to, to help the players, uh, well, basically with accommodation and uh, at the same time do something uh, a little bit cosy for, for our Swedes, since they travel most of the time uh, between hotel rooms. This is a bit different and it's nice for them to, to stay together. This Scandinavian bonding has become a tradition. We've done this uh, a few years uh, now, and uh, we usually bring a, a chef, and he's, he's cooking in a, a golf club in Sweden, and he's a, a keen golfer, so he's actually spending his vacation in, over here. Appetizing, 
and for the Swedes, that also applies to golf, especially following the country's success in pro events on both sides of the Atlantic. Golf has been booming in Sweden, well, since mid-80s, and uh, there's a lot of people taking up golf still. We've got a large number of players on the European Tour, but we still haven't got the major win among the men, and, and I think that would be a, a big deal for Swedish golf. Jesper Parnevik, who came so close to winning the Open at Turnbury in 1994, before being edged by Nick Price, also finished in a tie for second three years later. This time, it's been a much quieter championship, but a 70 posted early on Saturday eventually brings a useful move. Justin Leonard from Texas won the 1997 Open at Royal Troon. He tends to thrive on Lynxland and shot a morning 68 that would improve in credibility as the day went on. His playing partner, Justin Rose, also recorded a 68 to make a significant move as well. As the weather began to deteriorate, Leonard and Rose began to make their presence felt. You could say they reached the clubhouse just in time. At that point, though, neither knew what exactly was in store for the leaders. Clearly, there was a huge storm brewing as the leaders spent time in the range going through their final preparations. Across the bay, the dark clouds were rapidly approaching, but Sergio Garcia had his mind on the championship, not on the impending tempest, and played solidly in the initial stages of the round. England's Gary Evans, who had the distinction of being in the opening group of the 91 and 98 Opens at Birkdale, also looked good and would continue to thrill. The weather really closed in just after 1 p.m. Driving rain, fierce winds, and a severe dip in temperature struck simultaneously. When the final group teed off, it was more like midwinter than July. On the tee from South Africa, Danny Els. Generally, conditions were extremely inhospitable. This would obviously be a stern examination. It was one of the most difficult days that I can ever remember in the Open Championship for myself and, uh, and to the rest of the field. And you, know, you just can't believe how, how the conditions were. The weather was as bad as I can ever remember. It's almost unbelievable it should happen in July. It was more like a December, a January day. A fact reflected by an opening double bogey. Maruyama's America base is Beverly Hills, but the warm Californian sunshine seemed a distant memory as he too struggled in the conditions. Even those well accustomed to the nastier side of the Scottish climate were caught off guard by its impact. Colin Montgomery was comprehensively blown out of the running. His 84 was 20 shots worse than his score the previous day, and with it, the Scot gained an unwanted mention in the record books. Monty had one consolation. At least he was in good company on an afternoon that the golfing elite won't forget in a hurry. If you didn't laugh, you might have cried. And Tiger certainly saw the funny side when he birdied the 17th. It takes a fine sportsman to retain a sense of humor en route to an 81, the worst round of his professional career. Dreams of the Grand Slam gone, at least for 2002. While so many trod water, shot making Sergio pieced together a 71. You never know how it's going to go in, in, a, in a day like today. It's really tough to play. And, you know, if you get a good feel and 
when you start hitting good shots, you, you get some confidence, as I did. But you know, if you, if you hit a couple of bad shots, you, you can struggle big time. His fellow competitors empathize with that view. Score-wise, they were swiftly moving backwards. And at one stage, it looked as though Rose, Leonard and Garcia, snug in the sanctuary of the clubhouse, might well be the overnight leaders. But Harrington, who later claimed to have played in much worse weather as a junior in Ireland, was initially stubborn. Denmark's Thomas Bjorn also successfully limited the damage on the way to a brave 73 that secured a tea time at the business end of the championship on Sunday. Eventually, and thankfully, the rain ceased and the skies cleared. It remained decidedly chilly, hence the headgear, but the likes of Soren Hansen, the recently crowned Irish Open champion, began to claw back the odd shot here and there. The improving Dane would complete the day at three under par. Thomas Levé, attempting to go one better than Jean van der Velde at Carnoustie and become the first Frenchman to win the Open since Arnaud Massé way back in 1907, also produced the odd gem in the closing stretch to stay in touch. And Ernie, displaying plenty of steel, wouldn't be pummeled into submission either. His tee shot on the 16th was a truly classy effort. Maybe this time the twice US Open champion was on course for victory in a major on this side of the pond. And talking of classy, the same could be said about the round of evergreen Des Smith, the seasoned campaigner who managed to defy old father time and cope when so many of those in their prime struggled. As the accompanying photographer, still searching for that back page picture, trudged up the 18th, Ells wrapped up proceedings with a two-shot lead over Hansen. He had scrambled a 72 and was justifiably proud. I'm really pleased with, with the round. I cannot uh, explain it uh, well enough, I don't think. You know, I, I never thought I'd get it to 500. Um, I thought at best to have broken 76 or 77 today would have been an hell of a score, the way the, way the conditions were. I mean, it's the most amazing thing I've, I've seen for a very long time at, uh, at this championship. So it was that Els went into the final round in pole position from Hansen with a further seven players, only three shots adrift. They included Leonard and Rose, who had moved up an incredible 47 places. Conditions for Sunday, the final day of the championship, in stark contrast to yesterday afternoon's conditions, it's going to stay dry, it'll be bright, the sun will break through, temperatures up to a pleasant 18 Celsius this afternoon, with just a light west or northwesterly wind. The early birds on Sunday got to witness some smashing golf. And a few miles down the coast, off North Berwick, there was another cluster of birds, this time of the feathered variety, gannets, herring gulls, razorbills, kittiwakes and puffins all inhabit the bass rock. And Muirfield itself is something of a haven for wildlife too. We've produced this booklet to raise awareness of the important uh, wildlife and natural habitats found on the golf course here at Muirfield, and it's proved very popular. Flower and fauna, simply beautiful. We hope that this booklet illustrates that our open championship venues in particular can provide an environment in which wildlife can flourish. Certain sections of grass took quite a beating, the rough, but undoubtedly the open is an environmentally kind exercise. And that's why voles can comfortably coexist with 18 holes. But there aren't any rabbits in this field, and no one was shocked when Tiger came hearing out of the traps in the fourth round. Banishing thoughts of his problems on Saturday, Never Say Die Woods reached the turn in 33, 
then came home in 32. Pride of performance is a powerful motivator, and Woods was showing that he's made of stern stuff. Respectability restored, but that Grand Slam will have to wait. Australia's Peter O'Malley, renowned for his arrow straight driving, was another to make a strong early move. This eagle at the ninth greatly helped his cause, as did birdies on the 10th, 11th and 12th, to go to four under par for the championship. Likewise, things were going swimmingly for Gary Evans. Having birdied six holes for an outward 31, he cranked up the volume with this at the 10th. Good Evans, and it didn't stop there. Evans, who in a decade of European tour campaigning has never lifted a trophy, climbed further into rarefied air by also making a birdie at the 11th. Suddenly, the man from the seaside town of Worthing was installed as the one the rest had to catch. A potentially fairy tale story couldn't be discounted. However, David Duval, the winner at Royal Lytham in 2001, took a double bogey seven at the ninth and any lingering hopes of a successful title defence were extinguished. He didn't win, but in the final round he did what you expect from a champion. With a 65, Tiger Woods was deservedly applauded up the 18th. He would finish joint 28th and earn much respect. With Woods packing for the flight back home to Florida, there was just time for the galleries to grab some light refreshments or maybe even take a wee dram in the tented village. Before the final group set out in search of glory. Els, keen to win a championship that he's targeted for years, couldn't have made a worse start, finding trouble off the tee like so many others during the week. Hacking back onto the fairway was the only option, and a bogey five would result in a hole recognized as the toughest opener on the open rotor. Thomas Levey struck a crisp approach to the short par four second, birdie for the son of a Parisian doctor who won last year's British Masters at Woburn. And there was to be another birdie at the third, to go within three of the lead. Australia's Steve Elkington knows what it takes to snare a major, and this birdie at the fourth suggested another wasn't out of the question. Maruyama, much warmer than on Saturday, was playing much hotter golf. Recovering from a bogey at the first, the star of the East proceeded to birdie the next two holes to go three under par. But the Justins, Rose and Leonard, never figured prominently and those who thought that Des Smith could become the oldest winner of a major championship were disappointed. Still, though, a fine effort from the near senior. His level par total matched that of Woods. The early clubhouse leader was O'Malley. His 65 would set the tone on a day when Australians would play more than a supporting role in the drama. Evans led at six under par with Els, who after his first hole bogey was relegated to second. O'Malley and America's Scott Hoke were very much interested parties along with Levey. Following top 10 results in both the Masters and US Open, Harrington was acquitting himself admirably on the big occasion again. After that at the eighth, he stood four under. Moments later, Harrington was joined by Hoke who rattled in his fifth birdie of the day over at the tricky 14th. Evans, meanwhile, was standing firm with five straight pars from the 12th. A few more rolls and the 16th could well have yielded a bonus birdie. No point dwelling over that, and Evans didn't. Instead, he powered a drive into the ideal location on the 17th fairway. A birdie on the reachable par five beckoned. 
what subsequently transpired will remain in the thoughts of Evans as long as he draws breath. Well, uh, the thought it was pretty much over. Uh, I couldn't believe I'd hit it into sort of 100, 150 people. No one saw it, no one heard it. Can we all look down and look at me? I'd appreciate it. Not within five, ten yards, no idea. You know, and there was just so many people there. I didn't feel too good when I was walking back down the fairway. <laughs> but Dominic, Evans' caddy, thought quickly. He also went back to the original spot and helped his boss regain sufficient composure to find the green with what was now his fourth shot. Still, no one could have anticipated what would happen next. Displaying bulldog spirit, Evans refused to allow the golfing gods to desert him. I just walked down there and I just thought, just give it a chance, you know. And that's precisely what he did. Halfway to the hole, I liked it and then it broke slightly right and it was heading right towards the middle. I thought, oh, please. And when it made it, I just couldn't believe it. one of the great moments of the 2002 Open, and super sportsmanship from American Ryder Cup player Scott Verplank, who provided his playing partner with such encouragement. The heart, I cannot tell you how my heart's bumping. It's just frightening. What excitement, and still a hole to go. How would the story unfold? Over at the third, L sank this to return five under par. The Big Easy looked in relaxed mood and raring to go. But the emotional roller coaster ridden by Evans was to take its toll. Rough to rough on the 18th. Worse still, the green wasn't found in three. Evans would eventually have to delve deep to salvage a bogey. He looked shocked and now endured a long wait to see if his clubhouse lead would last the day. Do you know, I didn't even know what I scored when I came in. I had no idea. I just, I checked them off, but I didn't know what the, the final score was. I had no idea. Just was in pieces. There were those who thought that Maruyama could succeed, where the likes of Isao Aoki and Jumbo Osaki had come up short by becoming the first player from Japan to win a major. An outward nine of 32, including five birdies, set him on his way. But sadly, three bogeys in four holes from the 10th put paid to his dreams. The entertainer later rued his expensive laps as he signed for a 68 and five under. Much was expected from Garcia, but it was a relatively subdued day for the Spaniard. He fought hard, but a 69 wasn't good enough to deliver his first major. Mind you, the 22-year-old definitely has time on his side. Retief Goosen, winner of the 2001 US Open and top of the European Tour money list on arrival at Muirfield, threatened on the front nine with three birdies in succession. But he couldn't maintain that momentum. Denmark are two contenders. Soren Hansen moved to five under par by tapping in for birdie here at the ninth, but couldn't bounce back from a bogey six holes later. And Thomas Bjorn was always on the back foot after beginning the day with a crushing double bogey six at the first.
Steve Elkington, who just squeezed into this year's championship through final qualification, was taking full advantage of his place after a birdie on the 11th. This shot to the 12th set up another par to remain at five under. And those down under were also cheering on Stuart Appleby, here deftly saving par at the 14th to stay three under and in contention. For him, it was a confusing feeling. Well, I really had no idea where I was in the tournament. I was thinking, well, Stuart Appleby's playing nice, he's hitting the ball well, he's putting all right, what do I need to do? This was a multi-face charge to the line, and throwing in his hat was Padraig Harrington. This at the 15th brought birdie number four on the day and saw him climb to five under par and joint second with Evans and Elkington. His playing partner, Appleby, also only required three strokes on the 15th to move his score to four under. This has been transformed into a complicated picture in which Thomas Levey, playing bogey-free golf, was also entitled to have a say. With holes running out, the issue was far from resolved. Yet just when it seemed as though everyone was struggling to take the championship by the scruff of the neck, Ernie Ells struck a purple patch. A birdie on the difficult tenth gave the 32-year-old from Johannesburg a degree of breathing space, and his comfort zone, if you can call it that in the heat of an open battle, was expanded when he pounced with another birdie on the twelfth. Even when Els found trouble on the short 13th, he was unfazed. It uh, reminded me a lot of the Rodol bunker. It's an Andrews. I had a stance, and all I had to do was just hit it as hard as I could. In the eyes of many, the shot of the championship. But Els was then to discover the dangers of dropping your guard at Newfield. The shot on 14 off the tee, I was going with a two iron, and after I discussed it with Ricky, uh, we should have gone with a three iron, just put it in play. But uh, after making a mental error on 14, I know I had a lot of hard work left. Harrington, trying to end 55 years without an Irish name on the trophy, dating back to Fred Daly at Hoylake in 1947, needed this for an eagle at the 17th to go seven under par. Agonizingly line, but not length, Podreg settled for birdie. Feeling he needed more than six under to post the clubhouse score, out came the driver on the final tee. And the knock-on effect was a costly visit to sand, a closing bogey, and a case of pondering what might have been. Levé reached the 17th on four under, having played par golf for the whole back nine. He then moved up a gear. I was happy that one on 17 was unreal. I mean, uh, at that time of the day and being, you know, in contention a bit, you just feel that uh, it's uh, unbelievable to make a putt like this. An eagle three, six under par and you began to wonder if this was going to be his day. So what of Appleby? Jousting with his emotions, now five under, after a birdie at the 17th, had this for another on the 18th, a round of 65 and six under. As they say in the Antipodes, you little beauty. I was feeling nervous from the very first hole, nervous all day, but I guess good nerves, more a uh, stimulus than uh, anything else. But uh, it was good. I made some putts today. I hadn't really made any putts all week, so that was nice. Still, at minus seven, the title remained in the hands of Els, who had reached the 16th. It's a shot that, uh, you know, I'm normally good with because uh, I like to draw my irons. But uh, I just try to hit that seven iron too hard, you know. A worried look. And on the face of Ernie's wife, Liesl, worse was to follow. I went with a 60-degree sand iron, and I hit it actually a little bit thin, and then it went all the way down. And after that, you know, I was really almost gone. As Els was plumbing the depths, up on the 18th, Levey was basking in a standing ovation. 
he would make par and shoot 66 on a day when his original game plan had been conservative. He joined Appleby as clubhouse leader at six under. At the start of the day, I said, you know, you're in contention, I wanted to play next year. And uh, so I, my goal was to play just solid, you know, and, and try to make some putts. Els chipped back up the 16th green well past the pin and couldn't prevent a double bogey five. Once more, the door was flung wide open. He was now one behind. Walking off the 16th green was the lowest point of my, of my entire week. I was under the most unbelievable pressure there. I've never felt anything like that. All of a sudden, 17 is the, the most crucial hole of my tournament. Ricky tried to calm me down, and um, you know, he just said, just put the best thing you can on this, on this driver, you know, and I had to do that, obviously. I mean, if I missed the driver, I wouldn't be sitting yet. Even though he was bitterly disappointed, L somehow managed to boom one out there. Things were now looking good for Elkington, who, after birdieing the 17th to go six under, struck a majestic approach on a final hole. Was the pendulum swinging in his direction? It was a golden chance to set a stiff target. But not converted. Elkington had to be content with joining LeVay and Appleby, his fellow countryman, in the clubhouse on six under par. As Elkington conducted his post-mortem on the putt, Els birdied the 17th to regain a share of the lead, and then there were four. What a climax this had turned out to be. Els, by now refocused after his nightmare on the 16th. He found the fairway and then the green. He left himself this for the championship. It wasn't to be. Els was bound for overtime, and the prospect wasn't exactly enticing. I really tried my best on the 72nd hole to try and birdie it. The last couple of years, I haven't been good in playoffs. You now, when I left that putt short, I was really pretty much down in the dumps. On a day when 13 players were bunched up within two shots of the lead, there was to be an unprecedented conclusion to the 131st Open Championship. For the first time, the destination of the most prized accolade in golf was to be determined by a four-man playoff. It was decided that the groups would play the four-hole tiebreaker in two two-balls. LeVay made a valuable par on a first hole that's demanding in any circumstances. But after finding sand, Elkington was to bogey. After a quick sandwich and chat with his sports psychologist, Els was back on the tee and in the groove. Once again, finding the middle of the fairway. But LeVay, the least experienced of the quartet in such a high-stakes encounter, struck the initial blow with this for a birdie on the 16th. Divine intervention, maybe? The 16th held bad memories for Els, but the power of positive thinking enabled him to laugh in the face of his demons. A safe and sure power would follow. This time, the 16th claimed a different victim from the Southern Hemisphere, Appleby. Oh, 
Elkington raised flagging Aussie title ambitions with this, a birdie at the 17th. Then LeVay, who recorded a par at 17 to remain one under, threw away his advantage by ploughing into rough off the tee. Then he visited a bunker, and a bogey was staring him in the face. History was to repeat itself up at the green when Elkington missed a vital putt to the left one more time. His opportunity had now gone, the short stick to blame. But despite a five, LeVay retained hope. Appleby's misjudged bunker shot saw him ejected from the last chance saloon. With LeVay looking on, Els required all of his composure to take the two of them into a head-to-head -head situation. So it was that the first four-man playoff turned into the first sudden death playoff in the Open Championship. LeVay was relishing every moment as they journeyed back down the 18th. But there was no cause to smile when his tee shot ran into a penal fairway bunker. Very much advantage Els, and yet there was to be another twist in the tail. You could tell from the expression. When the South African pulled his second into the greenside bunker, he needed to pull off the most pressured up and down of his life to repel Levy's challenge. This was becoming emotionally draining for Els, but a wonderful spectacle for the galleries, who gave both combatants their third warm welcome up the 18th that day. As the applause rang in his ears, Els, already responsible for a stunning bunker shot on the 13th in regulation play, knew full well that something special was necessary again. Cometh the hour, cometh the man. How about that for a single shot under the microscope? Els now had several fingers around the claret jug. But LeVay was to remain resolute to the end. His ultimately courageous bogey meant Els needed to save par to become the first South African to win the Open since Gary Player in 1974. Champion at last. Relief is overriding emotion. It's just been an unbelievable four days and five holes, you know. Uh, I had a lot of patience yesterday, and to be honest with you, I guess I had a lot of patience today. To almost be a clear winner and then almost be a clear loser in the space of three or four holes, you know, it feels, uh, feels unbelievable, really. I uh, obviously... It was a very tough day. With a score of 278, the winner of the gold medal and the champion golfer for the year is Ernie Els. The words Els wanted to hear above all others. At times I really thought I would never put my hands on this and, uh, you know, it's just... It's the hardest tournament I've ever had to play this week, and uh, it's one of the most rewarding, the most rewarding, would I say. Um, I uh, don't come in here with a lot of confidence, and uh, I'm going to leave here as, as the Open champion. I mean, it's just, it's just been a phenomenal little journey for me this week. <laughs>